From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're Inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome, Inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. This is not going to be a newsflash. I worked for many years in Bill Clinton's White House. I've also made it pretty clear on past episodes of this show that I still have many friends who work in Joe Biden's White House and in his administration. But anyone who's listened to me week after week knows I strive to find the common ground in everyone, and our microphones have always been open to everyone. I've had Republican senators and cabinet secretaries on the show. And I also think it's a pretty good thing that people who enter or aspire to enter public service, that they've had a fulsome career in something other than politics before they ask for a fellow citizen's vote. Now, I went to an event last week with New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu. Long before Chris got to the State House in Concord, I followed him as a guy who served customers instead of constituents leading a group of investors who engineered a buyout of one of my favorite haunts, Waterville Valley Ski Area. I watched Chris manage a balance sheet, hire good workers, and make sure folks were safe and happy as they went up and down a mountain. On stage or on skis, Chris strikes me as a reasonable guy, someone I could work with. Another guy who gives off those vibes is David McCormick. Dave did a tour in government working in the Treasury Department in the second Bush administration, but he also did a tour in Iraq. As a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, Dave was an Army Ranger who saw service in the Gulf War alongside one of our recent guests here inside the Ice House, former Secretary of Defense Mark Esper. In Secretary Esper's book, A Sacred Oath, Mark details the myriad challenges we have countering the pacing threat that is the People's Republic of China. In Dave's new book, Superpower in Peril, Dave almost picks up where Mark left off, writing in one section, the Chinese Communist Party's economic warfare is the greatest external threat to American innovation. In a minute, our talk with David McCormick on his career and his new mission outlined in Superpower in Peril, a battle plan to renew America. It's all coming up right after this. When you hear the word sustainability, you think too big. When you feel you have to do something, you think too complicated. Hold on. Think about your decisions. Get closer. Those that are big or small for you. Your decisions and other people's decisions. Those that have to be made every day. Step back a little. Think of the decisions that add up to many more. There are millions of decisions that change everything, little by little, for the better. Now think about who can help you make better decisions. And there we are. So that what you save, the planet saves too. To keep moving forward without leaving anyone behind. And now, when you hear the word sustainability, you think opportunities. At BBVA, we're putting new solutions at your fingertips in order to build a greener and more inclusive future. BBVA, creating opportunities. Our guest today, Dave McCormick, is no stranger to Wall Street or our mission to preserve capitalism here at the New York Stock Exchange. He was CEO of Bridgewater Associates, one of the world's largest investment management firms, before taking on Mehmet Oz in the 2022 primary race in Pennsylvania, trying to get that Senate seat left open by the retirement of Pat Toomey. Raised in the Pittsburgh area, Dave graduated from West Point and, after completing his Army service, went to work for McKinsey before helping to bring software firm Free Markets public on that other exchange. There's a lot more about his bio that we're going to unpack in our conversation. But for now, welcome Dave McCormick inside the Ice House. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm really delighted to be with you today. 
Dave, you graduated from West Point a year after Secretary Esper. Your lives as cadets tracked pretty closely during the presidency of Ronald Reagan and his Secretary of Defense, Cap Weinberger. When you were a cow, did you know Mark as a firstie? And what was the world that you found when you paraded off the plane in 1987? You know, I, I don't think I knew Mark as cadets. I, I got to know Mark soon after uh we, we both left the Army when he was a staffer on Capitol Hill. But, uh, but we did serve, as, as you said, in that, in that period. I, I graduated in 1987, and we were really seeing the, the end of the Cold War, really right before our eyes. 1989, the wall came down. 1990, uh, the, the unipolar moment where America was the sole superpower and then tested soon thereafter uh, in the Middle East with Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. And, uh, and so it was a unique moment. And I talk about that in my book, Superpower and Peril, because it was really a moment of, of maximum economic and national uh, security capability. And, and sadly, through most of the period that's followed, we've been in decline. And, uh, and that's the focus of the book, how to renew ourselves from that period of decline. We're going to talk about how to renew ourselves a lot more in our conversation, also to talk more about your military service, Mark. But your book is dedicated to your kids and your wife, my friend Dina Powell, but also to your parents, Jim and Mary Ann. What kind of fixtures were your folks in the community? What did they teach you? Yeah, the, my, mom and dad uh, loom large throughout the book. I didn't really realize how, how big a part of, of different aspects of my life they, they were until I wrote the book. And they kept popping up <laughs> in various chapters. But they're both teachers. Um, we are, I think, seventh generation Pennsylvanians. Uh, my mom was born in Punxsutawney, my dad in uh, Plumville, which is right outside of Indiana, so Western Pennsylvania. And they both were teachers. And my dad went on to have a very successful career in higher ed uh, and became president of a, of a little state teacher's college, which became a university. And that's where I grew up. He was president of the college in Bloomsburg. And my mom was a, t a teacher as well. And at the, at the age of 50, went back to graduate school and did a PhD, which, which took a, a, a break while I was in the Gulf War because she wasn't able to focus on anything other than uh, getting me home safely. But, they, but they're a big part of my life, the commitment to public service. You know, I think decency and humanity they brought to everything they did, the commitment to, you know, the next generation as teachers. Dave, right outside the New York Stock Exchange where I'm sitting today is Broadway, where heroes have been honored with ticker tape parades. The largest in history at the time came in April 1951 for General Douglas MacArthur with over 7 million people in attendance. I want to hear a little bit from General MacArthur at West Point 11 years before that parade. Duty, honor, country. Those three hallowed words reverently dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, what you will be. They are your rallying point. They are your rallying points. Dave, your book starts with that quote. How did you get to West Point and what was your experience there? I was just there last week. I was there uh, last Wednesday and I walked the, the beautiful plane and I walked right past MacArthur statue and, and read that quote. And uh, it it's such a touchstone for what America is all about and what West Point's all about. And uh, a reminder, a, a funny aside here is that MacArthur's mother um, moved into the Thayer Hotel at West Point when he was a cadet. And uh, Dean and I have six daughters, and I keep insisting that uh, I'm looking for accommodations right outside their campuses where I, <laughs> where I can stay, which, which is the most horrifying concept uh, in the world to them. <laughs> Absolutely horrifying. But, uh, but I grew up in a small town, as I said, Bloomsburg. I, I was a decent student, but I was a, a really focused on sports, wrestled and played football. And I got recruited to play football at West Point. And then, and then I got recruited to wrestle at West Point. I ultimately wrestled all four years at West Point. Uh, Pennsylvania is a big wrestling state. And it was interesting because I didn't have really much interest in going when, when I initially was recruited, but my father insisted that I apply. He said, this is a personal choice you have to make, your own, but you must apply. And to my surprise, I was accepted. And in my small town, being accepted became a big deal because no one had gone to one of the academies for decades. And it sort of took on a life of its own, even though no one in my family had been in the military. 
and it became uh, really the greatest decision I ever made because West Point opened my eyes to the world, to America, and a sense of purpose, uh, which w- was sort of vaguely in my mind about service, but but West Point really is all about service to country. And it embedded in me, I think, this uh, commitment to serve uh, throughout my life. And I've tried to live by that. Now, at the beginning of that life of service, Dave, your enemy in the early 1990s was Iraq, part of the first President Bush's effort to push back an incursion into an ally of ours, Kuwait. Now, in the 30 years since, a lot of our military's time and treasure has been spent on securing that same turf, as well as Afghanistan. Was that time and treasure misspent instead of focusing on China? I've had a lot of time to reflect on that because uh, when I was in Iraq, in the first Gulf War, <clears throat> President Bush, uh, 41, made the decision to withdraw after Iraq had been you know, put back in its place in Iraq and, and pushed out of Kuwait. And, um, and that was the commitment he had made to the coalition. And when 9-11 happened and subsequently we invaded Afghanistan and then and then Iraq. You know, at the time, given the threat of weapons of mass destruction and the intelligence that I certainly understood to be in place, I thought it made sense. And and even wrote an article at that point that that said it made sense. But but now in retrospect, after 20 years, it's clear that there were a lot of decisions along the way that prolonged our time in Iraq, um, a, a lack of strategic clarity a lack of focus, a lack of political leadership. And I think there were enormous mistakes uh, made. And, and you know, you sort of see that, you talk about that conceptually on a podcast like this. Yeah. But then when, when, you, when you're on the campaign trail in Pennsylvania, you see it. And that's why I think you have this you know, rise of concern around Ukraine, which we can talk about in yeah. a minute. But, you know, the, the people that most suffered from 20 years of war were uh, people in, you know, the third and fourth quartiles socioeconomically. There are people in small towns in northeastern Pennsylvania and western Pennsylvania and Ohio that sent their sons and daughters abroad. Not only lots of lives, but we have lots of people that came back and really had their lives you know, significantly disrupted and, and still are back on track. A statistic that still uh, shocks me is that 22 veterans a day yeah. that take their own lives. And so we're, there's lasting effects uh, that, that, that we need to deal with, which I think call lots of the decisions into question talking about calling decisions into question, Dave, I helped bring President Clinton to Beijing and each of his successors in the Oval Office hoped for a better outcome with their counterparts, Zhang Zemin, Hu Jintao, Xi Jinping. You were Undersecretary of Commerce and Undersecretary of the Treasury during the second Bush administration. Did our past leaders misjudge their adversary? I think I think so. I think I think there was bipartisan misjudgment. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, there was a bipartisan consensus 20 years ago, just like there's a bipartisan consensus, say 20 years ago, the bet that policymakers made was if we uh, open our markets to China, encourage China for economic liberalization, that would be great for America and industry because we'd have reciprocity. That would be uh, great for the evolution of China and, and increase the likelihood that would be benign in terms of China's uh, goals and aspirations. And, and it didn't turn out that way. The intellectual property theft that's taken place over the last two decades has been enormous. China has uh, built really under President Xi a techno-authoritarian state, which which poses, as I say in, in, the, in my book, superpower and peril, enormous challenges, both economically from a national security perspective. The aspirations of China to displace America are without question. If you have any doubt about that, the last couple of weeks, um, when we saw the picture of President Xi in Russia encouraging and validating Putin's uh, invasion into Ukraine. And, and in the very same week, the Chinese foreign minister brokering a deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia, you see that China has a set of objectives and capabilities that truly threaten America and America's place in the world. And now we have another bipartisan consensus, which is we need to toughen and strengthen ourselves in response to that. What we don't have is a, is a clarity of what to do, a clarity of a strategy, which is what I try to outline in the book. You know, I say in there in a line that China has a plan, that it's executing brilliantly, and America doesn't have a plan. And, and this book is, among other things, meant to provide a plan. You're talking a lot about the people that you've met on the campaign trail and certainly about your roots, Dave. And 
Skipping back to the end of your time in active duty, you could have headed anywhere after you left the Army. I read an old item in the Post-Gazette about how Glenn Meekham and Sam Kinney, the founders of Free Markets, which you took over as CEO, worked hard to support the local community. Some stuff about how they rebuilt the public theater's new downtown facility. What was it like to grow a tech company that was so far from Silicon Valley? You know, that, that was quite an adventure. When I left the Army, my dad in particular was horrified because, you know, he's only 15 more years and I would have had a pension. And so he <laughs> was, he, you know, this the certainty and the, you know, I loved the military. I loved the Army. I, I almost stayed for a career. But eventually uh, decided to go back to grad school and go to uh, Pittsburgh. I was born right outside of Pittsburgh. And that was a remarkable stroke of good luck because this was in the middle of the the Pittsburgh's renaissance, which I talk a lot about in the book because there's a lot to be learned by how Pittsburgh recovered from the demise of the steel industry to become really a healthcare and technological, you know, a center, a innovation center in America today. But I had the good fortune of joining a small company called Free Markets. And Free Markets was one of the early users of the internet to create commerce, business to business commerce. And so we recruited heavily from the tech industry, Carnegie Mellon. And we were competing against the Silicon Valley, but it was really ideal because our customers were those industrial manufacturers across Ohio and Michigan and Pennsylvania. And they didn't want to necessarily deal with those Silicon Valley folks. They wanted to deal with people from Pittsburgh. And so it was an amazing experience building that company, giving people hope in Pittsburgh, that Pittsburgh could be part of the next generation, the next evolution of technology. You know, this was marked by putting our sign on top of the building, neon sign on, it was just the first sign on the on the Pittsburgh uh, skyline. So when you came in through the tunnel in Pittsburgh, any of you have done that, it's just spectacular that the city opens up in front of you, we had this sign of free markets. So it was a remarkable period to be there and a great joy to be part of it. And it really contributed a lot to the you know, building out downtown Pittsburgh where we had our offices. The free market story ends with a successful exit for everyone involved. And then you began this long run at Bridgewater Associates. And the founder of the firm, everyone knows, Ray Dalio, has been to the NYSC a bunch of times. We had Mark Hayes on this show a couple of months ago. You write, I'm going to quote you from the book, Bridgewater's process distinguished it, but so did its insights. What was the Bridgewater process and how did you fit into it? Well, I joined Bridgewater after serving in the government. You know, I had been the Undersecretary of Treasury during the financial crisis. I didn't really know about Bridgewater when I first got the phone call. I got it in November of 2008. And I said, I can't talk to anybody about anything. I'm I'm in the middle of, you know, what, what's going on in the financial crisis. But I said, call back in six months. And so I ultimately joined Bridgewater as part of Ray's desire to have a succession plan. At that time, Bridgewater was, you know, reasonably well known, but but much smaller than it is today. And what was unique about Bridgewater, among other things, was a culture of you know continuous improvement, radical truth and transparency, an idea meritocracy. These were key themes that weren't just words, but really drove how the culture of the firm worked. And it was the idea that in markets the right answers don't necessarily reside with the oldest, most senior person. And you needed to have an environment where people could, you know, debate ideas and, you know, really truthfully and rigorously try to get to truth with rigor. The second part of it was the idea that understanding markets started with some principles, um, fundamental views of how markets worked, which could be uh, systemized into a set of equations, algorithms that could be then used uh, to trade markets in a very diversified way. So the mantra was fundamental, systematic, diversified. And that was a really unique way of thinking about markets that Ray started 40 years ago when he would write down on a yellow pad of paper how markets were supposed to work. And ultimately, with computerization, he was able to create algorithms that reflected those views. And the beauty of that is you could constantly test your thinking, see what worked and what didn't work, and go back and adjust. And so it recognized that understanding is a compounding process and that by building on what you learned yesterday, you could be smarter for tomorrow. So it was an incredible leadership experience, an incredible way to learn about the world and learn about markets. And it was an incredible way to learn about myself. In the not too distant past, bring us to Bridgewater in 2020. Obviously, 
COVID took hold early in February or March, but not before everyone did their annual flock to Davos. Here's Ray on CNBC at the World Economic Forum that January. I want to hear him talking with Andrew Ross Sorkin about China. Does it play into not just whether the bonds are attractive or not, but whether there's a larger um, uh, 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 fight at play or battle at play? Um, There are four major conflicts that we're having with China. And trade is one of them. And this deal is a small part. It's a deal and it's done. But there's a trade. There's a technology war going on. Right. There is a geopolitical war that's going on. Um, There could be a capital war that is happening because what you're having is the emerging power in many ways going global and challenging an existing world power. And there's going to be lots to argue about. Dave, I've heard you talk about how you were in the drafting process of this book long before the campaign. So maybe you and Ray were sort of both at your computers as he was writing The Changing World Order, How Nations Succeed and Fail. But were you and he aligned on how you saw the landscape changing? Did it feel like a superpower standoff to you as well? We're more or less aligned on the quote that you just shared, but we weren't aligned in my view. And you know, we agree on lots of things, but we didn't agree on really the uh, evolution of the U.S.-China conflict and the motivations behind many of the things the Chinese were doing. So I saw China as an emerging threat. Uh, I saw that as early as 2005, by the way, um, as I write about in the book, some of the speeches I gave. I I certainly didn't see the techno-authoritarian success that China would have, where it's really a a technology leader and and confronting us and challenging us in many ways. But I certainly saw the early signs in 2005 of of where China was headed, and that's only gotten much worse. And I don't see its intentions as benign. I see China's intentions as aggressively countering U.S. interests. And so I think where Ray and I may have some differences, at least based on what I've seen him write, is that I view this as an existential threat. And I don't view it as, as misunderstanding on both sides. I view it as intentionality on the part of the Chinese leaders and Chinese Communist Party. I sh- we should say that our dispute, in my mind, is not with the Chinese people. It's with the communist leadership that's taking China in a very unfavorable direction. And that our response is in reaction to China's aggression. China's actions are not in response to our aggression. So the intentionality, the motivation, the root cause of the conflict, in my view, is what, where China is headed, particularly under President Xi. And so we need we need a strategy that both confronts China, but coexists with China, because China is the second biggest economy in the world and is going to be a rival superpower. But we need to we need to stand tall in confronting the aggression of China. I mean, when anyone sees an existential threat to something they love, they want to do something about it. You had everything going for you in 2021. You'd made your nut. You'd been married to Dina for a couple of years. And then you jump into the Senate race. And I remember my friend Jake Seward sent me a link to your new ad that gave all of us a couple of chuckles. I want to have a listen to the audio of that ad. I shot my first buck right over that hill. It was huge. It was a four-point buck. I thought it was a doe. Growing up, I bailed hay, trimmed trees, worked hard. It means he chased girls. I played football here, running back. Lots of touchdowns. Yeah. Guess who did pretty boys blocking? And the tackling. Dave McCormick's Pennsylvania roots will keep him grounded. I'm Dave McCormick and I approve this message because with these guys, I'll always remember where I came from. Was it a doe that you shot? I mean, tell me about the making of that ad. I mean, did overly protective image makers like I used to be warn you about appearing in camo holding a shotgun? Well, there was probably some worries, but the beauty of that ad is at the core of it are two truths. Truth one is... Those are my buddies from high school that I've known forever, and uh, we've stayed friends throughout our our lives, even though our lives have gone very different paths. The the one is a local sheriff, and the other went into the Secret Service and then came back and has has settled back in our hometown. So they're they're real dear friends. And the second is they never miss an opportunity to bust bust my chops. And, uh, you know, you can... Be a, you could be a fancy pants and move on with your life, whatever. And when you go, you go home. Those uh, <laughs> those guys, those guys give it to you. And so that ad was a lot of fun. And and those guys have newfound notoriety, which they absolutely love, as you as you might imagine. 
Tell me about putting the campaign together. The last Pennsylvania campaign I was involved in was as a volunteer for former Congressman Bob Edgar when he challenged Arlen Specter. Was it fun to reconnect with your roots and see old friends like the guys in that ad? It was mostly awesome. Mostly awesome. There, there were some parts of it that were, were not, not so much. But, you know, one of the challenges was we decided late. You know, the real catalyst, people had approached me on running when, when Toomey decided to step down. I, I uh, had initially thought it wasn't a great idea. And the Afghanistan withdrawal for me was a, a very poignant moment and one that made me say, you know, I'm, this, is, this is the straw that broke the camel's back for me. I wanted, I, I wanted to try to find a way to serve and, and make a contribution. And then we had a health issue in our family, which said, uh, led us to believe, you know, this isn't the right time. And so we decided not to do it. And then the health issue more or less resolved itself over Thanksgiving. And we said, what the heck, we're going to do it. And by the time we got into the race and I could professionally depart from Bridgewater, it, it was early in the new year. So it was only a five-month race for me. And as uh, Dina likes to say, um, I had zero name ID. So p- people, at, when I started, thought McCormick was a spice. My primary opponent was uh, Mehmet Oz, who had you know like 100% name ID. So... It was a challenge to kind of learn everything as a candidate. I've I've been a CEO for, I don't know, 15 years of my last 25. And, you know, I had had learned to lead in a certain way. And running a campaign, as you know, is completely different. You're not talking about nuance. You're an advocate for a set of positions. You're talking about yourself and why you, the voters should vote for you. I never talked about myself as a CEO. And so um, that became a challenge. But the greatness of it was, you know, we had, I had a pickup truck on my family farm, which saw that we had bought four or five years earlier. And I got in that pickup truck and I drove 30,000 miles over the five months. Every diner, VFW and fire hall I could find, I visited. And that, and that gave me a lot of clarity on the issues, the people, the obligation, the honor, the responsibility. There's that great line from William F. Buckley, which is, that citizenship in America is a privilege to be part of, you know, the greatest country in the world, but it's also a responsibility to do everything you can to keep it. And I felt that sense of responsibility and it was just reinforced over and over on the campaign trail. So uh, overall, a fabulous experience, but, uh, you know, it had, it had its ups and downs, but it was overall great. I mean, I want to get to one of those downs, Dave, because 11 days out from your Senate primary in Pennsylvania, you climbed into that pickup truck that you just talked about and went to an event in Westmoreland County. And there's President Trump there the same day. And at the risk of giving you a little PTSD, here's part of what he said in that one hour and 22 minute speech that he made. So I don't know David well, and he may be a nice guy, but he's not MAGA. He's not MAGA. He's more to me than he is MAGA. I do know that he was with a company that managed money for communist China. And he is absolutely the candidate of special interests and globalists and the Washington establishment. And those are the people that are not only spending millions and millions of dollars on his campaign. They have unlimited money to just try and destroy us. But they want to destroy this great warrior and a truly nice person. Not going to do it. And they're also the people that are ripping off the United States with bad trade deals, open borders, and every other thing that the people in this audience will never stand for, and you fully reject. What did he get wrong about you? Well, he got a lot wrong uh, about me. You know, the the back, the context of that was, you know, he had been, he had stayed on the sidelines for most of the campaign, which is what what I had hoped he would do. I knew he had had a a good relationship with Mehmet Oz, and so I, I had hoped that he would just, uh, he had endorsed an earlier candidate and then that candidate had withdrawn. And I heard he was going to endorse Oz. I called, I knew President Trump. I had interviewed to be in his cabinet. He had um, offered me the job of Deputy uh, Defense Secretary. Dina had worked for his administration as Deputy National Security Advisor. So we, we knew President Trump. And I ran a campaign, which I talk about in the book, where I embraced a number of the policies, which I thought made sense. And I explained what about them made sense in the book. Uh, when I went to see him, he was frustrated with a couple comments I had made publicly about uh, polarization. And you know, I was asked the question about whether I thought he had contributed to the polarization. I said, as a leader, I thought he had. But then he uh, said that I, he didn't think I could win the election unless I said that the 2020 election was stolen, which I told him I couldn't say or wouldn't say. 
And then a couple of days later, he endorsed Mehmet Oz. So that was the context. And I was surprised, frankly, with that rally because he came with the explicit purpose, I think, of uh, really attacking me because I was still ahead in the polls. And I was uh, three or four points ahead in the polls and I think was on a path to probably beating Mehmet Oz when, uh, when that happened. You know, what, what he got wrong, the, the warrior in the story is me. I am the outsider. I was running as someone who had never served in elected office. I was running as someone who had really no connections, got no support from uh, anyone other than my individual donors, and was running as someone who uh, thought that the system was broken and that the traditional party hadn't been serving Americans and Pennsylvanians adequately, which was, which was my motivation for running. And so I try to talk about that, that in the book. And to be clear, you know, when you lose a campaign as I did, 1.45 million votes cast, I lost by 900 votes. There's lots of things I could have done to, to win the, the election. So I don't, uh, I don't blame anybody other than myself for losing the election. But certainly having the president of the United States come and do a, a rally <laughs> against you de- doesn't help much. If you judge two former candidates by their Twitter feeds, Dr. Oz has pretty much gone back to that old focus on health issues and what has made him a celebrity. Well, you are still on the front lines of politics and policy. I saw a couple of tweets you sent out the other day from your return to West Point and the lecturing that you're doing. When the votes didn't go your way in 2022, how did you dust yourself off and chart a new course? You know, I said that it, even the, the day I conceded, I really didn't know and still don't know exactly the path. But I said, you know, I'm committed to Pennsylvania. I want to I want to be part of helping Pennsylvania. That may be helping other candidates. That may be being a candidate myself. And you can't have the motivation for running for office and say that you think the country's headed in the wrong direction and then lose by 900 votes and say, just kidding. You know, if you if you really believe that, then you kind of have an obligation to do what you can. And so the book Superpower and Peril, I started before I ever decided to run, before Toomey had even announced, I finished that. And the book was really a representation of what I was trying to do in the campaign, which is lay out a positive vision for where the country should go that's grounded in the values that have made America great, but also policies that reflect our moment and the challenges we face in terms of the, you know, the deterioration of the American dream as well as the challenge of China. And the book essentially lays out a path for educating our people, confronting China and securing America, securing the country. So that's what I'm focused on. And I'm not sure whether, you know, what the next step will be. Um, I'm I'm considering running again for office, but I haven't made any decisions. But I certainly want to be a contributor to the debate and uh, hopefully be part of the answer. After the break, more on that new course, more on the debate that Dave just mentioned, and the new fight we're in with China. We're talking more with Dave McCormick, author of Superpower in Peril, A Battle Plan to Renew America. It's all coming up right after this. Shopify Editions is back with over 100 product updates and enhancements all in one place. Explore our latest solutions for every aspect of commerce. From starting and scaling a business so you can sell everywhere easier. To flexible components for enterprise needs. Businesses can choose which technologies they need to create the customer experience they want. And developer tooling to customize any commerce experience. We know how important it is to offer the right mix of power, flexibility, and customization across our surfaces. No matter what you're building, you can build for the long term with Shopify. Visit shopify.com slash additions. Welcome back. Before the break, I was talking to David McCormick, author of Superpower in Peril, a battle plan to renew America, about his early life, his military service, and his career leading up to his 2022 Senate campaign to replace Pat Toomey. Now, Dave, we're going to pivot a little bit to the battle plan and what may take you and us to 2024 and beyond. I have been watching your Twitter feed, saw what we were just doing at West Point the other day. Another aspect of our military here in New York this week, the Navy will commission the USS Cooperstown. It's a freedom-class littoral combat ship, perhaps sort of past its time already, even as it gets its commission. You tweeted a Wall Street Journal story about another naval vessel, the USS Rushmore, being out of service for a key training exercise to deploy Marines to the Asia-Pacific in your book, and you quoted... Ernest Hemingway, who wrote, bankruptcy happens gradually, then suddenly. Are we in the sudden part? I think we're on the verge of the sudden part. Yeah, that's the, uh, 
you know, if you look at the the book Superpower and Peril that I just wrote, you'll see the the uh, covers very stark, big bold red lettering, Superpower and Peril, and then and then the book is very optimistic. And people ask me, how you know, wh- where's the where's the source of the optimism? And so I do I do think we're at a tipping point. I think that we have a combination of two things going on at the same time. We have some of the fundamentals at home deteriorating. Our, our economy is deeply challenged with you know record high debt, forty year high in inflation, the lack of social mobility, the probability of getting out of the fourth or third quartile less than it's been in any period in the post World War II period. Sixty percent of Americans living paycheck to paycheck. Two thirds of Americans think their kids will be less well off. Eighty percent of Americans think the country is headed in the wrong direction. So the American dream, the idea that you can do better than your you, than your folks and that we have that expectation if you work hard, play by the rules, it's not happening. And then second, we have this enormous challenge from China, which is displacing us geopolitically in the ways I described earlier. But but a, a critical statistic here, which you may have seen a couple of weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal, this Australian think tank had done a study of key technologies, 44 technologies critical to our economic vitality, but also our national security. This independent think tank concluded that China was ahead in 37 of the 44. So, you know, we've got this challenge outside, challenge within. And so it's an existential moment. So then then people ask, Where, where's the optimism coming from? <laughs> and the optimism comes from the fact that this is the American story. We get to the edge of the cliff, we pull ourselves back. We get to the edge of the cliff, we pull ourselves back. It happened in uh, the Civil War, it happened uh, pre-World War II. It happened in 19, the late 1970s when I was a kid growing up in rural Pennsylvania where we had 16% inflation and we had gas lines around the block and odd days and even days. And we had Desert One where we lost eight service members on the sands of Iran, a lot like the debacle in Afghanistan. And 80% of Americans in 1979 thought the country was headed in the wrong direction. 1983, I was at West Point walking through the, as a plebe, walking on those beautiful walkways, looking in the Hudson Valley. The economy was on fire, inflation in check, military buildup that ends the Cold War six years later without a shot. And it was morning in America. Leadership matters. Ronald Reagan brought that right leadership and the right policy. So that's the cause for hope, but we need policies and leadership right. that'll, that'll make the difference. In the notes of your book, you reference a guy that I read a lot at Swarthmore College, Samuel P. Huntington, who wrote in Foreign Affairs back in that time that you just referenced in 83 to 87, the buildup. He, he wrote, the ultimate test of a great power is the ability to renew its power. And that might have been a little easier to do in 1988 when the Soviet Union was fumbling between Brezhnev and Dropov, Chernyanko and Gorbachev. But how do we do it in 2023 when Xi Jinping has appointed himself leader of the CCP for life? It's always very hard to judge relative capability in the moment. You know, it's easy to look back and see it. But, you know, I'll say two things that uh, will seem contradictory, but I, but I don't think they are. One thing is China is really eating our lunch in certain ways, in technologically, uh, in its, its clarity around data as a key source of innovation and, and security, its geopolitical strategy, it's the way it's engaging around the world. And we have a much better hand than they do. <laughs> Those two things may seem a contradiction, but they're not. And by that, I mean the uniqueness of America is its agility, its resilience, and its versatility. And time and again, we have uh, shown an ability to adapt to the circumstances of the moment, whether it's new changes in technology or changes in the geopolitical landscape, where China is faced with really significant demographic challenges, huge indebtedness, an authoritarian system that's going to require constant oversight in terms of driving unity and uh, and the right behaviors across its citizenry. So the chaos and uh, dynamism of America ultimately puts it in good stead, I believe, for the future. But unfortunately, go back to history in the uh, and Huntington and Hemingway, it's only in these moments where the risk seems so extreme that America seems to find its way. And so it's a little bit of a dance here where people, I think, have a growing realization that we could screw things up and really destroy uh, the America we all know and love. And I'm hopeful and optimistic that that clarity of the risk, the threat, 
will also bring us together around sound policies, which I try to outline in the yeah. book. They're meant to be a conservative agenda that captures traditional conservatism and also the populist pulse that is reflective of, a, of the American dream not working for many Americans. But as I say in the book, it's really not about conservative, Republican, or Democrat. It's about America. And so the policies are meant to be really what's great for America, regardless of party. I mean, talking about America finding its way, the very earliest days of America's finding its way in your chapter on decline is not inevitable. You again visit Pennsylvania, but this time to Philadelphia, Dateline 1787, when the framers put securing the blessings of liberty on top of their agenda. In a country, though, that is still challenged by issues of race and class, not necessarily party or geography, how can liberty, that which makes us truly exceptional, be ensured to everyone? Well, that's, I mean, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that because what we're really, there's a whole section in there where I make the argument that America is truly exceptional. And if you don't recognize what's exceptional about it and, and are dedicated to preserving it, then the American experiment will be lost. And what's exceptional about it is it's a country that was conceived with the very notion that the government works for the people and is conceived in the idea that individual freedom and liberty are paramount. And what's happened since its creation is that it's been a constant journey in pursuit of that. And as you say, with very, very dark chapters associated with slavery and human rights and so forth, but also a constant striving for a more perfect union to get better. And so uh, what I say in, in this is I object to, you know, President Obama gave a speech where he said, yeah, the Greeks think they're exceptional, the Brits think they're... No, I, I object to that. I think that America is exceptional by any measure. And what is, what's happened in the world in terms of alleviating poverty, saving Europe from Nazism, the economic growth and vitality that America's brought to the world is, is beyond measure and, and in comparison to any other country. And yet... There's these dark chapters for which we need to stare at and can constantly pursue and get better. And so one of the things I'm worried about is that in our focus on all that's wrong with America, and I'm certainly not saying we should shy away from what's wrong with America, we've lost the essence of what's right about America. And we need to teach history and reinforce the uniqueness of that experiment, even as we acknowledge the things that still need a lot of work, and they're the ones you refer to, racism and so forth. So that's that's my take on it. And I'm, I'm deeply worried that our next generation is not grounded in a true understanding of that. And if you don't have that next generation thinking that it's their obligation to preserve America, I'm, I'm afraid that we won't. And talking about the next generation, Dave, part two of your book, you give that section, The Renewal Agenda where you focus on talent, technology, and data. And I want to just take each in quick tandem, starting with talent. Now, you gave the 2009 commencement address to graduates of Bloomsburg University, where you mentioned earlier your dad once served as president. The next commencement of the college is next Saturday, May 9th, in Redmond Stadium. But well before they get their diplomas, how do we make radical improvements, as you write, to our K-12 education system? Well, this is... a uh you know, this has been something that if you're a conservative, people have talked about school choice as the key for ensuring the right quality in our schools, the right competition for great students. And I would argue choice, school choice is the absolute best way to ensure opportunity, equality of opportunity, because it's not the, uh, it's not the blue collar kids, it's not the minority kids often that have choice if we don't have choice, because they're, you know, Wealthy parents can send their kids anywhere. And so I think our current system really has a heavy bias towards disadvantaging those kinds of students. And I think we have a moment. So COVID gave parents a window. I heard this on the campaign trail over and over again. They're looking over the kids' shoulders. They see the curriculum. They see the role teachers are playing in their students' lives, the kinds of conversations that uh, teachers are involved in versus parents. And they found it wanting. We saw this in Loudoun County with Glenn Youngkin. We see this in the legislation that many states are passing in Arkansas, Iowa, Florida, and elsewhere. The school choice really is a tipping point. And I know this is very, you know, this is an issue that uh, divides people often along party lines. But for me, that school choice uh, revolution is upon us. It offers an enormous opportunity to improve the quality of K-12. 
and an enormous opportunity to give a greater opportunity for all because the money is on the back of a student and goes with the student as opposed to going into a, a public school system, which by any measure, outcome measure is failing and which by any measure the dollars that have uh, been allocated over the last 10 years are disproportionately going to administrator administrative cost and not to students. And so it's one of those things, if you're in business, it's such a failed system that I can't imagine we wouldn't embrace structural changes that would fundamentally bring about change. Now, here at ICE, we have a long list of engineering jobs that we need to fill. You write, and I'm going to quote you here from the book, that skilled immigration can help fill the labor gaps we're experiencing in our economy and make our nation more innovative and dynamic. If you were in the Senate, Dave, how would you work with Secretary Mayorkas both to secure the border, but also yeah. remain true to our creed and make it more easily welcome those who can help us rebuild the nation? I talk about that at length, the uh, skilled gap, the skilled worker gap we have. And there's t- two solutions to it. One is you know, we have a mantra, I grew up with this, where, you know, a four-year college education is the path to a great middle-class life and great opportunity. And we know that there's a great opportunity to, to train people with technical skills to be able to fulfill some of these great jobs in manufacturing or fracking or whatever it is in places like Pennsylvania. And there's just inadequate skilled workers. We don't have enough emphasis on that. We don't have enough programs on it. And I think that if I was a U.S. Senator, one of the things I'd be emphasizing is allocation of resources, VA benefits, Pell Grants, all of that to making skilled training, two-year degrees, community colleges, and so forth, a real area of focus because it's it's an enormous economic opportunity. It's, It's one way to address that American dream slipping away problem. The other thing I do talk about at length is skilled immigration. So I visited the border. I think by any measure, our border is a disaster. We need to secure the border. I think that the current administration has failed, failed on that. And I think there's a lot to be done. But let's not let that conversation stand in the way of recognizing that skilled immigration has been critical to America's innovation, its economic well-being, and it's great for all Americans. It doesn't displace U.S. jobs to have skilled immigration, particularly if we had reforms to our immigration system. And so one of the things that I think offers real opportunity is a reform to our current immigra- our legal immigration processes. We've got to embrace that, I think, for economic well-being and economic opportunity. And one of the things I outline in the book is an agenda for reform of that legal immigration system that's more analogous to what Canada has, which is zeroing in on particular skills that our economy will most benefit from and, and all Americans will benefit from. In the area of technology, Dave, superpower and peril uses, I will posit, a relatively unsympathetic villain in Huawei to demonstrate the perils of Chinese dominance in technology. But I'd wager, without asking for proof, that you and Dina have a couple of iPhones and iPads lying around. And until a spate of recent stories about expanding manufacturing in India and buying microchips made here in Arizona... Apple has been producing about 95% of its products in China. I want to hear a clip of Tim Cook speaking at an event late last year at the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Facility that was just opening up in Arizona. Good afternoon and hello, everyone. I am so glad to be here to celebrate this milestone with you. We're joined this afternoon by President Biden, whose presence sends a powerful signal about the significance of this moment. President Biden, thank you for your leadership and thank you especially for signing the CHIPS Act into law, which will make more and more projects like this one possible. So Dave, you say in your book that President Biden's CHIP Act is both flawed and incomplete. Why? First of all, the sentiment, what's behind it, I think was good in the following sense. Uh, We have made a huge strategic failure in the sense that our entire semiconductor industry is offshore. That creates huge national security risk. 90% of the semiconductors we need are manufactured 90 miles from mainland China. This is madness. It is a bipartisan failure. And the CHIPS Act is a first step uh, designed to try to address that. I think there's three things that uh, are are flaws. One is the government should be much more involved in basic R&D. We spend about half of what we did on basic R&D as a percentage of GDP than we did in 1950. 
And that's something that the government should play a unique role in from a national security perspective. Second, I argue in the book that we shouldn't do what China does, which is state-owned enterprises and, and, and subsidization. But the CHIPS Act is more analogous to traditional industrial policy in the sense that it directs money to specific companies. And second, you know, soon after the CHIPS Act was passed, you saw the Commerce Department roll out a set of policies that were designed to ensure that if you were going to get government money, you had to have certain health care standards and diversity and inclusion, a whole series of other things, which is exactly the problem with industrial policy. It, it's a slippery slope of the government imposing either political mandates or agendas beyond uh, those that market forces would necessarily dictate. And so I applaud the goal, but I think it was failed in its execution. And what I try to outline in the book is we can't have traditional industrial policy. We also can't have China state-owned enterprises. What we need to do is have a set of policies that are directing private capital to the areas that matter most for America's security and doing that through thoughtful tax incentives or co-investment by the government that draws in private capital and doesn't suffer from the government picking winners and losers. We know what that means historically. We don't want any more cylindras. We got to have a much more significant flow of capital into these areas of such uh, geopolitical significance. I don't think the government playing a heavy handed role is the answer, but I do think the government being much more involved is which is why uh, I have a part of the book, which you, you may have seen, which is says, what would Milton Friedman say? And Milton Friedman, I'm not sure what he would say. He would probably argue against what I'm arguing for. And I, my response to Milton is, hey, we're losing. So we've got to find ways to draw market forces into our policy toolkit in a way that solves the policy problem, but doesn't sacrifice some basic principles of markets. So we've talked about talent. We've talked about technology. Let's let's finish this sort of central part of the book on data. ICE's second quarter earnings are going to be released on Thursday. About a third of our business is literally data services, but data really infuses the whole business. And Bridgewater Systems too, you wrote, ran on millions of pieces of data. I used to think that was somewhat a cliche phrase to say data is the new oil. We've used it on this show a couple of times, but why do you believe data is the new sunshine? Well, first of all, data is of enormous strategic significance for innovation, for national security, for personal privacy, for social behavior. I mean, its importance is growing exponentially. And that's why it's of such strategic importance. The reason it's not like oil is it's non-rival. And what that means is it can be used over and over again. So it's got added power for that reason. And this is an area where China also has a plan and we don't have a plan. And China, because of its authoritarian model, has access to data and is using data in, in ways that I'm not advocating we should do, but it gives it enormous advantage. And, and we've got really no national data strategy. We don't have adequate privacy to perfect into, to protect individual data. We don't have adequate guidelines for sharing data for innovation purposes. And uh, we don't even have appropriate liability that I argue from a social media perspective in terms of guiding the marketplace of ideas, which in my estimation is, is tilted in a very significant way in terms of the social media atmosphere, which is where the majority of Americans, a growing number of Americans are getting their information. So what I argue for is a data framework that talks about how we use data at home, but also how we collaborate abroad to make sure that the power of data is brought to bear in preserving U.S. economic and national security leadership. So moving forward into leadership, because it's a good segue, let's let's finish up our conversation with part three of your book, which is Leading Renewal. And let's start with a conversation that your old friend and mentor, the former Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Bob Kimmett, had a couple of years ago, sounding the alarm on China in his conversation with David Weston on Bloomberg. Let's take a listen. But let's be clear, we are in a decades long competition with China, not just on trade, but also political, military and other issues. Um, we thrive on competition. Let's all play by the rules and continue to compete. So I think this trade deal will be an important next step. But we are looking at decades of competition between uh, our two countries and, by the way, our two systems. Your view is confront China, secure America. How do you do that? Well, on the China front. You know, there's sort of two things I argue. First, the, the first, and this can't be lost, and I don't hear enough of it, we need to go to the gym. 
at home. <laughs> we need to build muscle at home. Part of our challenge with China is we, we're not doing the right work at home. And the, so that whole education reform, data security, all the, the technology policy, those are necessary to have the kinds of strength at home that we need to confront China. And that has nothing to do with, with what China does. It has everything to do with what we do. And so that's a big part of the book. But the second thing we need to do is have a whole of nation strategy for dealing with the challenge of China. And I lay out four or five pieces of that. First and foremost, strategic decoupling. And so what I argue for there is the things that have enormous national security implications or economic implications where we should reduce our dependency. Um, Semiconductors is the best example. Pharmaceuticals is another. Think about this as concentric circles. And there's a set of things in the in the closest concentric circles that we we wouldn't want anyone to have control of, but certainly not the Chinese who are our primary adversary. And we've let ourselves become dependent, and that's uh, we need to bring that home. I am not one who's arguing for a complete decoupling. I think that very practically speaking would be very difficult, would have enormous economic implications. And you know, going through the campaign trail in Pennsylvania, you know, you go to a manufacturing facility and they say, "Listen, we need to stop the." Uh, you know, the unfair trade practices of China. I agree. And I argue for that. But, you know, I go to a Harley Davidson supplier and they say, hey, listen, we want to have access to Chinese markets because we're selling our Harley Davidson's there. And uh, the racks we make for the back, 80% of that business goes to China. And so I think it's probably okay to sell racks for Harley Davidson motorcycles to China and probably natural gas and other things that would create their dependency on us, but not those things that were dependent on them. So just strategic decoupling is one, two, investment reviews. I think it's uh, shocking at this point that we have venture capital firms in the Silicon Valley investing in artificial intelligence companies in China, whose primary customer is the PLA, the Chinese military, the Communist Party. We need to have a reverse CFIUS to review those kinds of investments and stop them. Third thing we need to do is hold China accountable for bad behavior. The the most notable is uh, coronavirus. It's, uh, It's also an example of where we're not having an open and honest debate and from a media perspective. The idea three years ago that the COVID virus might have emanated from a lab in Wuhan, given that it st- started in Wuhan and that the lab does such research, was viewed as conspiracy theory. You couldn't even talk about it. Now, three years later, we have acknowledgement that our intelligence services think that that's a real possibility. So that kind of thing, we need to hold China accountable for. And then finally, we need to have a much more, and we're start- starting to see this, clear strategy for how we engage with our partners around the world, like the Philippines, like Australia, like Japan, to ensure that we have a set of alliances that will help check Chinese economic and security aggression abroad. And, uh, and that's the outline for, uh, that, I, that I put forth in the book. Dave, one of the final chapters is reviving institutions, and it spans really from your days playing for your high school football coach at Bloomsburg High School, Tom Lin, to ESG pressures that you and your colleagues felt at Bridgewater, to what you see as the current risk aversion in the military. How do we get more people like Coach Lin to speak the truth, call people out, and get leaders to assume responsibility for what happens on the field? Yeah, you know, I, I really try to, to to imagine. First of all, you can write a policy book, but I got halfway through writing the policy book and I said, well, if we don't have the right leaders to carry this forward, it doesn't, you know, you can have all the great ideas in the world, but the leadership is, is an incredibly important part of the equation. And you need leaders that demonstrate a certain set of characteristics, which I talk about, but I think we need also leaders to renew our institutions. I argue that we have real institutional corrosion across all the institutions, whether it's our military or our business community. And we see that in one of the most important factors of leadership, which is trust, which the American people have lost trust in their Congress, in their public officials, in their business leaders, even in their military, which for decades had been the, the, at the pinnacle of public trust. And there's lots of reasons for that. But I think first and foremost, there's this notion of institutional decline where institutions are starting to take on a life of their own and putting forth policies and agendas that uh, aren't necessarily in line with their with their missions, their core missions, uh, or their core goal. And the examples I use, for example, are the military, where I think the sustainability agenda has almost hijacked the military agenda. And, and, and the Biden administration, the Army, which I, I, of course, feel particular allegiance to, released its climate change strategy before it released its warfighting strategy. And so what I talk about there, I try to do this in a very 
thoughtful way. I try to uh, acknowledge what the goals are, but I think we've, we've lost true north in terms of institutional leadership. And, and there's some people that say we ha- the only way to fix this is to blow up our institutions and start over. I don't think that's practical, but I do think the right leadership at the top can completely reorient the direction. And so I try to outline what that would mean in our military and driving the innovation agenda, what it means for business leaders that I think need to come back to the core principles of, of building businesses that uh, maximize value for shareholders, for employees, and for customers, and don't go down the slippery slope of, of CEOs becoming political actors. I think it's a very hard thing to stop once you get started. I know that's controversial, but I try to lay that out in a thoughtful way as somebody who's been a CEO of a public company, of a private company, someone who's been in, on boards and sees all these pressures. And I try to make the case for you know, in, institutional clarity and integrity and leadership that drives towards those core missions. And then in the final chapter, I try to then talk about what the essence of real leadership is and what kind of leadership we need, transformational leadership at this moment. Yeah. And as we wrap up, Dave, and let's talk about a time for leaders and it'll bring us back to really one of your toughest days. I want to bring you back to your concession speech almost one year ago, June 4th, 2022. A recount showed that Dr. Oz beat you by 950 votes out of more than 1.3 million cast in the May 17th primary election. Let's hear what you said that day with Dina by your side. With the, the recount largely complete, uh, that we have a nominee. And today I called Mehmet Oz to congratulate him on his victory. And I told him what I, what I always said to you, that, uh, that I will do my part to try to unite Republicans and Pennsylvanians behind his candidacy, behind his nomination for the Senate. It wasn't the first time you'd ever been counted out. Ray Dalio once asked you to become co-CEO of Bridgewater, but then he fired you and asked you to take on a a lesser role. And you could have left the firm, but for the next five years, you bore down, logged more miles than anyone else in the company, and then rose to become CEO again in 2017. Now, there are calls for you to do what Bridgewater did, be that man in the arena that Teddy Roosevelt talked about at the Sorbonne in Paris. I'm not going to ask you if you're going to challenge Bob Casey next year. Everyone is does that on all the shows that you appear on. But answering that call is for you to do at some point in time of your choosing. But what I am interested in knowing is if you did do it again, answering the call for a time for leaders, what would you do differently compared to what you did 2022? Well, there's so, you know, th- there's so many things that um, were incredible about that experience. But the, the thing that I learned most was finding my voice as someone who was trying to be a political leader, essentially was a full circle of understanding the issues and sort of working my way through what were on people's mind. But then authenticity, being myself. And I'm not suggesting I wasn't authentic in the last campaign. I was at every step of the way. But I think authenticity is the currency of politics. Authenticity is, I think, what's often lacking in politics today. Authenticity, I'm, I'm not sure if it's always a winning strategy. I'm not, I'm not sure you can win by being completely authentic. But for me, the clarity of authenticity is the thing that I value most in terms of pursuit of public service is the thing that I would emphasize that every question would start, every policy position, every opportunity would start with, what do I authentically believe? What do I think? And how can I convey that to the voters? And uh, I think if you have that as your true north, then, um, you know, however the chips fall, you're going to feel like you've done your best and, and competed well for the thing you're competing for, which for me was to make a difference. And so I think if you don't start with authenticity and carry it through from beginning to end, your capacity to make a difference in a way that you're proud of is also going to be really limited. So that's the watchword, authenticity. And you are authentically being surrounded by your two biggest fans, your golden retrievers, who are calling for you to get into the race through their plaintive cries. I can hear them at the rally out in western Pennsylvania right now. That just may be calling for lunch. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, so we'll, we'll wrap up real quick, Dave. But the circumstances of 2022 were one where President Trump was trying to exert his influence by anointing nominees, as he did with Dr. Oz, as he did with Carrie Lake. I began my introduction talking about Chris Sununu, who doesn't shy away from distancing himself from President Trump, but he leans in hard to crossing over to appeal to Democrats and even New Hampshire liberals. 
What's the case for more people like Sununu, Mitt Romney, as the future of the Republican Party? I don't want to uh, align myself with a particular person. The case I think need, that needs to be made is what I made in the book. You know, I took 250 pages to make the case. And I think um, the Republican Party needs to course correct. I, I think the traditional, you know, Republicanism, small government of the party was inadequate to meet the needs of the people. And I think the populist pulse that we saw under President Trump has merit but needs to be aligned with some core conservative principles. So that's the agenda I've tried to lay out. And I think that agenda with the right leaders is what's going to take the Republican Party, the conservative movement and the country forward. And, you know, I'm in favor of candidates and leaders that want to look forward and, and have an agenda like that. You know, I'm happy to hear other agendas, but that's what I was trying to do with the book is kind of lay out a roadmap of where I actually thought the country needed to go and the solutions for the genuine problems and crises we face. I won't ask you to make any predictions about the next campaign, but you write a lot about your joy in attending the Army-Navy game. I've been to the last two, the Meadowlands and Lincoln Financial in Philadelphia. Last four of those contests split two and two Navy Army and Navy leads the series 62 to 54 with seven ties. Next matchup, December 9th, Gillette Stadium in Foxborough. Navy has a new coach. Any predictions of the next Army-Navy game? I, I, go Army. I predict, I, I, will, I will strongly predict the Army will win this game. <laughs> <laughs> With that strong prediction, I'm going to let you go. Thanks so much, Dave, for joining us inside the ISS. Thank you for having me. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was David McCormick, author of Superpower in Peril, a battle plan to renew America. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at ice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Pete Ash with sound engineering and editing from Ian Wolf. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 